Hi, I'm Edwin Bailey with Skanska. I'm going to be presenting uh, on how Autodesk model coordination for design and construction can streamline the process. We're going to be kind of going over a fully cloud-based workflow, and I'm excited to share our lessons learned and best practices in addition to some project examples. So let's get into it. So I did mention I, I work for Skanska. We are a global company. We have uh, offices within uh, 11 countries worldwide. I am uh, located in the uh, Houston, Texas office. I work, you know, uh, regionally in the central part of the U.S. and uh, work on a lot of cool, fun projects for Skanska. Uh, we do have 30 offices within the uh, U.S. as well. So, our journey um, is is really. Uh, you know how we how we came into the cloud. You know, started we started out in in you know beta. We're going to kind of go through what that example, what that looked like, and then move into uh, our current workflow. So some of the benefits that I see with cloud-based uh, model coordination is that the information is constantly updated, and so you always have the latest and greatest, and so that really benefits the entire team. You know, all stakeholders, and so. You know, the, the team members can upload their models as they make changes and then uh, see how they are affected in relationship to all the other disciplines within the, uh, the platform. <clears throat> and really that makes for an overall uh, better uh, coordination experience and it makes it much less siloed. And so you can um, have almost near real time access to the information, which is pretty powerful. Uh, with that comes increased stakeholder participation. And so, you know, we'd like to start off early on with constructability reviews with our design team, but it also, you know, uh, we'll, we'll see increased participation from owners, uh, you know, within our own, uh, you know, company uh, for the general contracting and then subcontracting. And so the nice thing about this platform too, is that you don't have to be an expert in, the 3D modeling programs to utilize it. Once it's kind of set up and it's, it's running, you know, that might be a little bit more technical, but once it's up and running, uh, pretty, pretty easy for any user to get in and to add their expertise, their know-how to the conversation. And this is a great platform to enhance communication. Uh, there's auto-generated uh, issue reports, email notifications go out as uh, issues are created. There's an awesome instant messaging platform that is it's kind of fun to see when people utilize that to uh, communicate back and forth and, um, you know, be able to see and resolve their issues directly in the applications where they're modeling them is uh, pretty powerful. So here's an example of uh, model coordination. You know, we're, right now we're um, in the uh, there's three primary um, tabs in, in that, you've got your models, clashes, and views. Here we're looking at the models and we can go in and uh, add them individually and combine them so you can see like a, uh, a holistic view of your project. You can turn on and off different models. Um, navigation is pretty simple. You've got your, you know, your standard uh, view cube as well that's there. And so I guess, like I mentioned, like it's pretty easy for anybody to get in and start looking at it. A very, very powerful feature is this automated levels tool, which is uh, generated from the Revit models. And so as you're, it allows you to slice and dice the model and get in and analyze it. Um, one caveat though, is that you'll notice that um, in this level selection tool, there's multiple level fours. Now those are probably set up as um, working levels for modeling purposes. Sometimes you get a really thin slice. So I'm gonna go in and explain later how you can um, turn those off. As far as navigation goes, first person perspective is um, a, a great tool to get in and, and look at the model from an interior perspective, although not entirely necessary, like with the, the standard uh, navigation control, you can click and zoom in and rotate around objects pretty easily. There's also a great measure tool. So, you know, as you're doing an analysis of just looking at the model and stuff, you can, you can measure things out. Um, and then as always, uh, you know, the properties from the BIM models get carried over. So you can click on elements and see what those uh, properties are. And so all in all, it's a great um, visual uh, tool of combining the models, um, but the information is accessible to everyone at that point. And it's really easy to navigate, really easy to get in and, and look at the models and, and dissect them. And that really increases stakeholder participation across the board. And we're excited to use this platform.
So when we first started use, utilizing it, uh, we had a campus project. It was kind of ambitious, you know, being that it was just barely out in beta. And, you know, we primarily use Glue and Navisworks for the coordination on these projects, but we did pull them in to the software and we started to analyze, well, what can we do with this? And uh, it turns out that, um, you know, like we, we weren't super successful with this. We did do some internal reviews and we found some, some, um, some things that we needed to fix on, on the models. But, you know, we primarily use those other platforms. About the same time, however, um, we were working on another project and uh, this one, we decided, you know what, we're gonna see what we can really do with this platform. So it was about 2008, and you know, we wanted to utilize this for design coordination. And so the, the platform was still pretty beta at that point, and we wanted to find a, a way to have the design team uh, collaborate because this was, a, you know, being a culinary arts um, building, you know, there was a lot of, uh, equipment and things that needed to go in there and a lot of you know services to those equipment that needed to be uh, properly coordinated and so you know during that design process this was a great valuable tool to be able to run clash detection we could group uh clashes based off of specific models and uh the only thing that it really lacked was a way to document that and i know there's multiple ways of documenting that in some other uh platforms but uh, we ended up using a, um, you know, more of a copy paste method. And so um, we we did screen captures and then we would take, you know, copy element IDs um, out of the uh, coordination model as we were kind of creating and assigned clashes. So let me show you what that looked like. It was, um, you know, it looked like it may have been a lot of work, but on a, on a weekly basis, um, our project engineer would go in and she would um, extract out the uh, the screen captures and, and the element IDs for the design team, and then uh, we would you know talk about those in our uh, coordination meetings. So this was a, a weekly process, and you know it, it worked. Um, but uh, you know once we were able to get the uh, the actual issues, it became a game changer. Here here's a project where um, you know it's a new, another campus project. It's a one of our biggest projects in Texas a lot of new buildings additions renovations and we thought okay after that experience and after some of the new features and, and the platform had built out and we had successfully done this multiple times on you know coordination for design projects we thought okay the software is now ready that we could implement this on not only for design coordination which is what we did on these buildings but also um, for construction coordination and so these were the first two projects where rather than just doing design coordination between uh, you know, the architects and engineers, uh, we, we started out with that process. So during the design process, we, we had one of our main MEP experts in the field go in and provide constructability feedback to the design team throughout the process. So that way that the documentation, there was a lot of issues that were pre um, coordinated and pre-worked out before we ever got to uh you know the construction and so that really streamlined the process downstream with our subcontractors and in on these two uh, projects we were able to bring in all of our subs and have them work directly in the software versus uh, a you know more of a uh, desktop application and so we're all in the cloud we're all uh, collaborating uh, assigning issues and uh, I, I will say that um, none of the team had previous experience with this, but they were all able to pick it up and utilize this uh, new platform. And these uh, two uh, projects were a great success for our coordination efforts. So the other cool thing about this is that we were able to set up a single project for model coordination. And uh, we had kind of two separate spaces. We would have the design coordination folder with all of our buildings and all of their files in there. And then we would have our construction coordination folder. And so those are two separate spaces. But what was cool about that is we could set up the separate spaces for the different phases of coordination, as well as all those buildings in there in a single project. And, um, you know, that's a pretty powerful tool to be able to bring an entire campus into a single platform and then assign per, you know, like we have different subs on different buildings and we we're able to go in and assign each one of those uh, subs and those companies to uh, the correct access for the projects um, as well as for the design team. And so this was a uh, phenomenal way of organizing the project and coordinating it for 
during the design and the construction phase. So our, our you know, once we had completed those two projects, we thought, okay, what's what's the next big thing uh, that we could uh, utilize this on? And since we had a proven um, workflow, we decided we would use it on one of our large uh, commercial development projects here in Houston. Uh, the interesting thing about this project is that it is one of our one of Skanska's own commercial development projects. So we uh, are both the owner and the general contractor on this project. And um, just a quick little overview. The cool thing about this uh, site is that it's wrapped around essentially like a boomerang uh, around an existing uh, hotel. And it, you know, it faces, so there's all these views that face out towards this um, uh, Discovery Green Park. And so it's, it's kind of a fun, fun design, very challenging design to build, you know, footprint to build on. And, you know, just a little bit of extra detail, you know, there's, um, you know, multiple, multi-story level, you know, parking, uh, multiple terraces for the building. There's some, some retail on, on the ground space. So a very fun and unique class A office space building. And the, I think the most interesting thing about it is how it fans around that existing building and the core of the building is on the back side. And so uh, very, very fun project, uh, fun one to coordinate with. A lot, you know, like high end, you know, we had a, had a design architect, architect of record, engineers on the project. So we were all collaborating in the cloud and, you know, we would do this for the both the design coordination. So we brought in, um, you know, Skanska uh, CD as the owners, uh, the design architect, um, architect of record, engineer, general contractor as ourselves. And, you know, we were doing this during the pandemic. And so, uh, you know, the design coordination uh, was, was all done virtually. And again, this platform was phenomenal for being able to coordinate together as a team. And again, none of these uh, individuals had previously utilized this software, but they were all able to pick it up um, quite successfully. So on, on this particular one, we had, um, you know, another uh, MEP specialist that, that ran our design uh, coordination meetings, uh, as well as the construction coordination. And he's done a phenomenal job. And this is the first time he's ever even been in the platform. So my um, hat's off to him. Um, how it looks on the design coordination is a little bit different than construction coordination. So we had about 10 Revit files, um, 12 model views that get extracted. So uh, we'll, we'll go in and we'll take the MEP, which is, you know, depending on how the project split out uh, engineer wise can be in the single file or not. And the, the software is able to allow us to separate it and, and subdivide the models so that we can run clash between those individual disciplines. Uh, we had zero CAD unless you want to count some of the site stuff, but we didn't really pull that in for the, uh, Actual, you know, actual 3D coordination uh, for the design coordination. And we really utilized that level selection tool as we were going through and looking at the models. In, in total, there was about 12 models that we were uh, clashing between disciplines. On the construction side, however, it gets a lot more uh, complicated. Um, you know, the, the thing that I found that was interesting on this project is that, um, you know, it's primarily between, you know, general contractor and subcontractors, the coordination process. But because of the experience through the design coordination, our, you know, the design architect, uh, our architect of record and engineer, and as well as uh, Skanska CD as owner, were all still very much engaged in this process with our subcontractors. And it was the communication back and forth was better than I've ever seen on a project. Um, as far as like Revit files, you know, we, we had about six different Revit disciplines um, per level. We had uh, four CAD files, so now we're integrating some other uh, software into this, um, other, other data sources, which complicates things. And on average, you know, we had about 10 models per level. And so we had to split the model out, or at least we chose to split the model out per level based off of those CAD files. And rather than, you know, just 12 design models, we ended up with uh, 300 plus. We're actually still in the process, so we're not 100% um, done with the coordination, but we're uh, getting close. So, what does that look like uh, compared to design construction coordination and um, you know the actual construction coordination setup? And you know we're we're able to work on either our own account or if you know we want to work with design and they already have a platform set up, we'll we'll jump in on on theirs and uh, provide feedback. And you know typically you'll go in and you'll see like uh, your your models uh, separated out again if they're 
multiple disciplines within a file on the design side. On the, on the construction side, um, a lot of times those disciplines get reworked for um, shop drawings and prefabrication and things like that. And so those will be separate files a lot of times. And so there's less of subdividing the models. But again, it just depends on, um, you know, how things are, are bought out and, and subdivided. But the, the amount of uh, players and, and individuals, it, it, it grows almost exponentially, it seems. So that... That setup, you know, again, um, becomes a little bit more challenging on the construction side. And I think the, the software, you know, previously we, you couldn't handle a construction coordination uh, workflow, but the way that it is currently, I think it works uh, phenomenally for that as well. So let's just go over a little overview of the design coordination. And um, we're going to uh, show a quick video here. So. Right now, you need to go in and set up model coordination, and it's it's based off of a folder. So underneath project admin model coordination, you'll set up a separate folder. You know, we set it up for for the design coordination. All of the documents lived underneath document management, and so it's a separate folder that the design team or ourselves could go in and upload models, and then uh, those models would extract out the geometry and model views based off of uh, the settings that we would um, set up. And so once those are extracted, they show up in the model coordination. And so here you'll notice um, I'm selecting the MEP. So that single MEP file gets subdivided into those three discipline files. And so that's uh, set up um, within uh, the Revit file itself. Uh, you also have views here. Um, this is a way of uh, combining which models you want to see. And, um, you know, on the design side, you typically don't have too many models, and so you can just select them on and click view. Interesting thing is we actually did our kind of more of a logistical model as well. So, you know, with our cranes uh, as well. So we kind of pulled that in because the uh, site footprint was so uh, tight. But, you know, it's able to handle all of this geometry from, from all of those design disciplines uh, quite well. Uh, again, during design construction, we're utilizing that level selection. And from here, you know, we're able to go in, uh, the users, uh, whether it be owner or, or uh, architect engineer or ourselves, we can go in and analyze the model uh, visually as well as go into clash mode. And so clash mode is super powerful in this program. I really love the way that it works because it, it allows us to specify what our primary model is and then turn on or off the clashes that we want to see and focus in on based off of all those other models. And here, I have all the models loaded, but I can go in and say, hey, clash just the mechanical model with you know, some of these other disciplines. And you know, it, it then isolates and highlights just the, uh, the clashes of those models. And so we were able to do this uh, per level. And so we would run uh, clashes and we would swap out what our primary model was, and it would group those clashes accordingly. And we could jump from level to level and go in and see how how is the uh, you know the coordination stacking up from from level to level, um, and then also you know we could see it from an entire model perspective. So if we wanted to go in and, and look at the the design model and say okay you know how how are our, our risers working out uh, where where are our issues, we could go in and um, see the model in its entirety and quickly hone in on those, those key major focus areas where we have issues, you know, whether it be clashing with structural or, or anything else. And then, you know, the fact that there, you know, the, the software had evolved to where there was these issues uh, um, capability where we could go in and start to document, identify and assign who, you know, who needed to do what. And so those, you know, on this project, we ended up, I think there was over, you know, like I'd say about 80 to 90, uh, issues that we had identified and assigned, but there were a lot more of that too, is just visually getting into the model and, you know, having the designers be able to look at their models compared to the other ones and say, okay, we have some issues here. And that, you know, that we were able to work out a lot um, that didn't even get documented. So uh, on the construction side, let's go in and take a quick brief overview of how that process worked. So the construction coordination is very similar, you know, we're gonna set up a separate coordination space, keep that separate because we have different parties that are involved. And so, you know, it's, a, it's another um, folder within document management, and then you'll wanna go in and, um, you know, create your, your subfolders. 
so on this particular project, rather than multiple buildings on a campus, this was multiple levels because we had a lot of different files. So we kept the, the Revit files in the root of the project folder. And, you know, on the different level files, we used that to organize all of the CAD files because those were typically modeled per level anyway. So we wanted to just have a nice organization. And so it's just the coordination space is set up on that uh, main subfolder. And then it's, it's able to extract and pull all of the files from the subfolders. And so you'll, you'll see that you have hundreds of extracted models, whether they're from CAD or from Revit. Uh, again, on the Revit models, we actually ended up subdividing the discipline models per level as well. And I'll show you why we did that. Um, but this is where having a good naming convention is key. So I'm able to do a search here based off of a level, um, highlight those, you know, filter out those, um, those models, and then save them as specific views. And so views are essentially just a list of models that you want to have uh, loaded and so you can jump between those those views and say, I want to go from level one to two to three or whatever. Uh, so on the left, you can see all the different models that have been loaded in and then quickly jump in from regular mode to clash mode. Again, specifying what is my primary model that I want to look at and then uh, clash compare to any other discipline, whether it be structural or, or anything else. And, you know, really powerful to jump between levels and issues were were huge so very beneficial it's a very simple system you've got open answered in this example here i'm going in and i'm reviewing a thumbnail of what the original clash was to what was answered it turns out that one of the lights was missed and it didn't get lowered like the rest of them so what i'm quickly doing is i'm reopening that issue and what i'm going to do is i'm going to type in a little note uh and, and let them know hey this you know, you, know, you missed one essentially. So pretty powerful to kind of jump back and forth through that system. So your color coding is, you know, uh, orangish blue when it's been answered and then gray when, when you when you closed it out. Here's another quick example as far as like, you know, we're in clash mode, we're, we're going in, we're reviewing some, some duct work and we want to uh, isolate that and say, hey, let's just make sure that we're out of the structural model here first. So I'm gonna isolate the structural model. Um, we'll notice that there is some you know issues with the ductwork clashing with the uh, structural beams and so the nice thing is that it does group these um, you know depending on the perspective of what your primary model is and so i'd like to keep the the models that i know i want to assign the issue to as the primary but that's not always the case uh, and the nice thing is you can group clashes and this is important here is you want to make sure that your thumbnail as you save this out is what you want because that's what's going to be presented later on to do a comparison be between, hey, did they actually fix this or is there still work to be done? And so uh, another thing I like to do is go in into the title and, and give them direction right there rather than putting it down in the description below so that it's, it's very direct. Hey, you got to you know, lower the duct out of the beam. Uh, you know, we'll go in and assign that to a user. We'll give them a specific date and you know, the location. Uh, we'll set it up so that the reports know what level this is associated to. And once we click create, the uh, user that we assigned will get an email notification and they can actually see this in their authoring software as well. And so this is a, a very powerful tool. Uh, I didn't really show you the instant chat messenger that's kind of built into that as well, but you can have a conversation back and forth uh, on those particular issues. And so hugely um, uh, beneficial and, and very powerful uh, communication tool. So if that wasn't technical, get prepared because I'm gonna do a little bit of a deep dive on some of these technical things. I'm probably gonna to have to go quick for timing here, but if you're not into the technical details, now would be a good time to uh, check your phones. So I mentioned clash groups, and I would definitely say that this is way more powerful in the fact that it, it auto clashes the groups. And I love the way that it does it in the fact that depending on what your primary model is, you're gonna have groups clashed. And so in this example, if we would have had the, the structural beam set as the primary model, all of those ducts would have been grouped underneath a single clash and we could have uh, assigned it that way. And then you may choose to do so. Uh, it just depends on how you wanna work. And so there's a lot of flexibility there. Uh, and then you still, like I said, you can combine uh, groups of clashes even further as you go in and assign them. Uh, so very powerful with the way that the uh, clash groups um, work. 
issues. We love them. We love issues. Um, now that we've got them, uh, I definitely think we're able to say goodbye to Navisworks for construction coordination because beforehand, I mean, it, it just wasn't possible. And so again, we, we first started utilizing the, the issues tool and assigning them during design coordination. And then after that was so successful, we were like, you know what, this is a game changer in the way that we can really combine information and have, you know, things much more accessible and, um, you know, way, way better workflow, in my opinion, than the desktop uh, software. And so, you know, the fact that we're able to assign a single individual to a user or an entire company of, you know, multiple users, if you have multiple people working on this project, um, you know, it's, it's just super powerful. Admins, you know, they're able to, so as an admin, we're able to see everything. We can go in and filter things out um, by, by trade or company or, or whoever we have it assigned to. Um, and then what the status is, whether it's closed, opened or answered. And so just a phenomenal, like very simple, easy to use solution that works great. And this ties into the 2D uh, documentation on markups as well. So it's, it's platform wide. And so it's just the way that it's been pulled into the, the model coordination, I think is um, really, really powerful. Okay, one thing that kind of threw me off when we first started utilizing it was locations. So we were like, how do, you, how do you edit these? Okay, so these are set up underneath the project admin and you can set these up however you want. Basically, you could say, hey, you know, here's my building one, here's my level one, two, three, whatever, or even subdivide that even further based off of area. So you set this up manually, and really all it is is a way to help you filter out your issues as you've created them um, uh, per, per location. And so, you know, you set them up in admin, and then you do it once at the beginning of your project, and then they're there uh, throughout the process. Um, so that's um, just another key piece of information for you. Project members are also important to set them up properly. So it's good to have them uh, assigned to a, a company. And then as you're going in and you, you know, if you have a, a large project, you can go in and uh, create your subfolders for your coordination spaces and assign uh, different companies to that. And so it, it's a lot easier to assign company than individuals, as well as manage the permission levels. And so we like to be able to let them, you know, the users be able to, to view, download, upload, uh, but not delete. And that way people aren't going to be able to delete other people's uh, files by accident. And if they do happen to upload the wrong file, they can just notify us and we'll, we'll delete it for them and clean things up. So um, that's, that's a good uh, workflow as far as like uh, project members. Uh, reports. I would say the reports are really uh, beneficial for those that aren't assigned to the issues because that, that gives everybody access to all issues within the project. And you can kind of see how many, of you, how many of them are opened, how many of them are, you know, what phase or what status. And uh, unfortunately, we kind of have to do two reports. One is there's a very detailed report that has your thumbnails of the issues as well as the, the details and everything you've assigned, but you can't group by company, which is kind of what I would like to do. So I end up having to make another report. And that one I have, you know, instead of uh, listed out in issues numerically, I have it uh, grouped by company. And it doesn't have all the detailed information, but at least it, it lets each company know how many issues they have on their plate. And then for you know detailed information, they go online into the software itself, or they can access the other report. All righty. So some best practices uh, for Revit views, model geometry. Uh, as you're extracting out your views, what I found is that the default 3D view, the one with the little 3D squirrely brackets, that is the default one that gets extracted. And we all know in a work shared file with multiple people that that either gets deleted or neglected. And there's always some random stuff going on in that view uh, if, it, if it survives your project. So uh, if you have visibility settings, you know, work sets, phases, options, whatever's going on in that file, unless you specify a different model or different view, that's what's gonna get extracted. So just be aware of that. Um, you know, your, your MEP should be, separate it out and then um, the, the separate views. And, and then also if you choose to, you can subdivide your model by level. So these are all separate views. It's what you see is what you get as far as it being extracted. And you wanna go into your publish settings and this is where you want to create a separate set. You can call it BIM 360 or, or ACC for Autodesk Construction Cloud. Uh, specify which views you want that you've already set up in your project. Make sure that they're both stay checked 
And then as you upload your version of the model, it's going to continually extract those models. So the only type of user error you might find is that, um, you know, somebody might uncheck a file or they might add some extra views in there. And if you add too many, you know, we had one instance where uh, uh, one of our subcontractors, they ended up loading like hundreds and hundreds of, uh, you know, shop drawing 3D views into their published set. And it kind of bogged things down until we figured it out. But, you know, easy fix. You can just come in here, manage your published settings again, and you're good to go. So the other important thing I mentioned is the levels. And so you may not be aware of this, but there's a, a couple of different settings you want to have in there. Um, and so the, the key thing is, I, I think it's good to have, you know, whatever the architect's levels nomenclature is, follow that for your design disciplines so that you're consistent inside of BIM 360. Then if you have extra levels that you need to create for modeling purposes, whether it be, you know, structural MEP or whatever, you want to go in and you want to go to the settings and turn off building story. So that way, it doesn't think like, hey, this is a separate building story. I need to subdivide this and split the model out from level to level. And so if you have like a mezzanine or something, you know, that you need to have a specific level for for modeling purposes, but it doesn't actually make it out as a building story, you want to turn those off. And that way they don't show up and you're not going to have these weird thin slices in your model. You can also set your story above if it's not just the, you know, the next level above. You have to kind of skip one. Um, you have a feature for that as well. So something to be aware of and that's how you control that and that's my recommendation as far as like uh, best practices for levels naming conventions are huge everyone has their own you know set of standards here so here's an example that we utilized um we won't get into the details here i'll let you come back and look at these but just know that they're they're important to be able to set up here uh properly so you can filter out you know you know building company trade um as well as levels and it, it really helps out in managing and setting up your views with, you know, the different pieces of the models that you want to see uh, as you're working. Revit best practices, uh, your levels should be, or excuse me, your files should be linked in, you know, internal origin to internal origin or project base point to project base point. But the way that the models are extracted, they're based off of the shared coordinate. So if you have a site plan that's like a million miles away and, you know, well, being facetious here, but if it's a far, far distance away from the actual true origin point, your, your models get extracted like that. And so when you're working with CAD, I find that, um, you know, it's, it's good to, uh, you know, link those origin to origin as well. And then I'll show you on the next slide, how we, how we handle model alignment, but, um, you do want to, in the, in the Revit files, you want to make sure that you've got your, your level names, you, you manage your building stories and you manage your published settings so that you know what's being extracted. Uh, on CAD, you know, this platform originally didn't work out too well with CAD, but they, they continue, as they continue to develop it, it got really, really quite powerful. So, like I mentioned, you don't want your CAD files to be linked to the origin, you know, your Revit files based off of shared coordinate. It's easier to keep those, you know, uh, much closer to the, the true origin of the, of the project and say, hey, model, you know, alignment is origin point in CAD to project origin in Revit. Then, what you can do is align those within the software. And so we found, you know, point to point with uh, cubes that the origin points of the files allowed us to initially align it up. And then as you add your new files, you can just copy over those settings from file to file. And it's a very speedy process to align all of your CAD to your shared coordinate from your Revit files if it differs from your project origin. So. I mentioned there you can see this uh, these issues and uh, things within the Revit uh, authoring uh, software. So here's a quick link uh, for you. It's a little bit behind. You know you have to log in, access it through you know your products and updates. It's available and um, you know it's 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 great for updating and changing models. Uh, there's also a Navisworks uh, plugin. I really uh, tend to um, shy away from this just because I think the the cloud platform is so powerful. Uh, I think this is kind of a crutch for some people that just can't get away from Navisworks, but it is available. And our workflow is not to create clashes or issues within Navisworks and upload them, upload them to the cloud, but more just to allow those that are comfortable in navigating in Navisworks to load the, uh, the, the files, open it up, see the issues. Uh, we do have a few users that they would, you know, upload a secondary version of their models and make some slight tweaks and stuff before they would officially upload to the cloud. So that's a potential workflow that I think is good. Um, so who's ready to enter the matrix? All of you, right? Okay. So 
if you take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Uh, just a little, you know, side note there for Matrix fans. There is a clash matrix in the software. I find that it can be a little bit overwhelming as your project grows. Um, and I think, uh, you know, as powerful as this could be, your best bet is to set up your views, go into clash mode per level and really do a deep dive because you're always going to have false positives on clashes. You're never going to clear everything out hundred uh, percent. And, you know, this, the way that uh, our workflow is, um, you know, just dive into those models. Um, the software is, you know, pretty phenomenal, pretty great. And we like utilizing it here at Skanska. So uh, if there's any questions, I'll, I'll take those now. I really appreciate everybody's interest in this and uh, appreciate everybody's time. Uh, again, uh, thank you Autodesk for having us and we're you know, looking forward to what the future holds for this platform.